Wait for it. There we go. Alright. The other thing's running too. We good? <clears throat> yeah, I started that way earlier. Okay. Now we could use all that content we had. Alright. <coughs> Hem. 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 All right, hello. Crickets. Welcome to another episode of Verbal Laxative. I'm Jason. Since then. Brian. We're not redoing it. So, it's been a while, guys. Everyone's doing good. No, no COVIDs. This is the 46th episode. We still haven't gotten the intro down. Well, only yeah. half a second late. <laughs> it wasn't that half awkward a of a pause. <laughs> well, you know, there was some toes stepped on in that intro a bit too yeah yeah yeah. yeah. it's my, uh, my bad no no it's my bad or it's both of our bads or nobody's bad it's jason's bad it is my bad <laughs> no no it's my bad guys it's my bad oh but no i we're just happy that you finally got back on hassan is like voted by our fans as the most likable character i highly doubt that <laughs> um I did the poll personally, and I was also the only one who took the poll. So, yeah. He's also the, the one poll. that voted, that voted yeah, exactly. himself That's as I mean. the worst one. <laughs> I would actually. Uh, my self confidence amongst the best. All right. It's, it, it's great to have everybody back again. Uh, how is yeah, everybody's? It's been a while since we've had this full cast again. Full house. Mm. Have you, uh, Hassan, been keeping up with our podcast? Don't be afraid to say no. Okay, then no. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trap. <laughs> Get him. I don't blame you, but... Um... I haven't, actually. I've, I haven't had time to join, and I haven't had time to listen to... It's all good, man. Time. I was just going to say, because uh, there's been on multiple occasions that's been mentioned that uh, Zin wanted to talk about some books and stuff with you and you know we're yeah. always wondering what you think about stuff we talk about yeah i don't remember any of it but, <laughs> um, we're gonna yeah. do it we're, we're definitely gonna do a wheel of time one we're gonna get phil on and we're gonna do a wheel of time one yeah, yeah. they have do they have time travel in that one <clears throat> no they uh, i don't want to say it's not really but not really <laughs> let's just say not really you should totally do it where you guys talk about it from the ending to beginning. No, yeah, we're not going to fuck it up like you watch, the way you watch TV shows. <laughs> the way you watch TV shows. We're not going to do that for this one. How Straight about out. you just listen to the podcast in a different order? Yeah, man, just, just like play it backwards. Sp- just play it backwards like a satanic song. Watch, there's actually satanic messages in our podcast. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, play all my podcasts backwards. I'm always giving a message. My last one, the the, the filler episode, play it backwards. I dare you. <laughs> you can blow your mind. Halloween episode. We don't even have to record it. We'll just play back random clips. <laughs> Worship. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so this is one of our... Uh, is finally we're back to our uh, classic setup of our classic cast, and uh, as a favor to Brian, he was very enthusiastic to talk about, give his hot takes about some random shit that he found. So Brian, take it away. <laughs> it wasn't random. I think it was all decided by YouTube and their algorithms. They knew I was interested in this topic, so <clears throat> they brought it forth to me. Okay, and so it, they weren't wrong because obviously <laughs> you're talking about it now. This is true. It worked. It turns out YouTube was right on the money for the for you. Yep, for sure. Okay, so I guess to start off with, um, when you guys were younger, did you guys walk to school? How did you guys get to school? Like elementary and middle school. I myself, uh, when I was younger, I walked to school. It was close enough. And then later on, school bus. After I moved to some other places where school wasn't as close anymore. Yeah, so metro, yes. Typical. Anyone else? I was... uh, Elementary school was basically driven to school. So the parent taxi, eh? Basically, but it was... 
pretty close. We only lived like a few blocks away or so. And yeah, middle school onward, it was all bus. So you were capable of walking to school in elementary, but your parents drove you instead? I don't know if it's capable <laughs> if I'm just like six years old to walk by myself to school. <laughs> well, my mom, she she walked me to school when I was in elementary, or uh, sorry, kindergarten. And then she would take the bus from my school to the train station, and that's how she would get to work. Oh, shit. And then in, and then in grade one, she's like, yeah, you're old enough. You should just walk by yourself now. Is it Was and it then, easier for her to just take... Was that an easier? I imagine that's a longer yeah, path for her. That that Maybe. made her trip longer. Okay. Yeah, it made a couple. Or, well, the the time it would take her to walk me, and then the time to get on the bus, right? So it adds some time to your commute. So, a uh, year after, I would have to walk to school, and then I've been walking to school probably up till up till university when when my school was way too far for me to walk physically. Yeah. Like so that school, just I... means that just means you you've you've lucked out in the way where you've always been to school, uh, close by to your house. Yeah. So my elementary was probably a fifty minute walk. My middle school was closer. It was like ten minute walk, and then my wow. high school was a forty five minute walk. So I had to walk across <laughs> my community. <laughs> okay. Wait, so you yeah. walked forty five minutes every day. That's pretty much at the border between, school. like, yeah, that's yeah. pretty much between the border between like. Uh, Walkable, um, walking not. or yeah, not not even worth it. Well, the bus wasn't too much. Well, like the bus, I think it's like a ten minute walk to the bus stop, and then it'd be like a twenty minute uh, drive. Mm -hmm. So like walking wasn't like wasn't that much longer, right? And yeah, I would it, save money from bus. It, it, it would it would seem longer in winter, in the dead of winter. Yeah, it is a more challenging thing. So there are times where I may consider getting a ride but you know during high school time some of your friends could drive too right so oh yeah, yeah. you can always arrange like carpooling and stuff like that of course you mooched off of them of course you did you borrow your own <laughs> fucking lawnmower of course of course they drove you <laughs> i did have i did have a very generous friend who yeah. drive us so <laughs> i was not have any friends that drove to school not in high school no i think all of us were like too poor <laughs> You can still buy, you know, if you really look hard enough, you can buy a piece of shit car for a hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's, yeah. No excuse. That's true. That is true. <laughs> All right. Except so, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. Did you have anything to add to that? or? I was no, no, don't, don't. Don't ever be polite. Just fucking cut me off. <laughs> I don't All have right. anything to say anyway. Just go. <laughs> All right. So, I'm looking at the stats now. Um, back in the day, I guess probably 20, 30 years ago, pe kids walking to school in Canada was about like 59, 50%. What yeah. do you think the percentage is today in modern times? Much be, must be much less, I 15. would guess. I want to say like, yeah, 20%. Wait, well, yeah. wait, oh, wait, I got it. 20? Is that what it was? Oh, it's 29%. I was waiting for Hassan. No. <laughs> All right, so it's twenty nine percent, right? So wait, 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 wait. So Hassan, <laughs> what do you think the percentage is? Twenty two first. Oh, he wins. Four. He's the closest. He All wins right. after after it's already been revealed. No, so, no, I said, I said it before Brian revealed. Oh, we couldn't hear it. It's okay. Oh, you yeah. won anyways. Yeah. Oh. Good. Well done. So <laughs> well done. There's a significant change, right? And. If you look at uh, another country, um, the Netherlands and Amsterdam, they're around like 46%. And a lot of their kids there actually bike to school. So Yeah, biking is way bigger there. Biking is way bigger there, yeah. Like, if you look at biking there, they're like about 70% of their uh, people bike. And if you look at bike enthusiast state in the U.S., which is Oregon, only 7% of the people there bike. And they're they're the bike central of U.S. So there's it's there. That's a bike enthusiast state. <clears throat> Oregon, yeah. They have a, really shit. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have pegged and it's not, that. And there's not even that much people that bikes in percentage wise. So when you look at uh, Amsterdam, that biking is a huge thing, especially in the Dutch for the Dutch people, right? So there's an article written uh, in Global Mail that talks about why our children stop walking to school. Oh, I can't wait and to hear this hot take. And the issue is that parents are driving kids to school. Like, 
the case that Jason was pointing out where he lives a couple of blocks away, but his parents drove him to school. Yeah. That is that is the issue that causes other kids to not walk to school. Because when parents <laughs> drive the kids to school, there's more cars on the roads. And then when there's more cars on the roads, it's less safe for kids to walk to school. And then the irony is that the safest thing to get your kid to school because of all these cars is to drive them. And then by doing that, you just contribute to the same problem. God damn it, Jason. What is wrong with you? I didn't have a say in the matter. <laughs> right. So... Like, this got me thinking, because a lot of my friends who are now parents, they're getting to that age. And when I talk to them, they're driving their kids to school. And I'm just, like, mind-blown. Because this is the contributing problem that we're having. And when we talk about, like, kids, you know, not getting enough exercise and things like that, it's like, of course not, because they're not walking to school. Like, it's, like, a basic thing that kids should be doing. Like, we we hear about our grandparents walking up hills both ways with the snow going to school. I never heard that before. It's a stereotypical thing. But <laughs> it's yes, a stereotypical my thing. grandparents never said that either. Right. But some parents did. And that yes. became a norm there. And now kids today walking to school is the abnormal. Like everyone gets driven to school and and that's an issue, right? And like that that issue kind of like it snowballs into other areas, but like walking to school, like it's just such an ingrained thing that no kids are doing anymore. I would have to disagree with that. At least where we, we, because in the mornings, pre-COVID, the buses used to be packed with kids. So even though they weren't getting driven by their parents, they were still taking transit or something to get to school. Yeah, bus, busing, biking, those I'm I'm okay with because they. Those make sense because you're walking to a bus stop, you're, you're loading a bunch of kids. That's fine. It's the individual one van with one parent and one child dropping their kids in, at the front of the door of the school. That's the issue. All right. Let's hear, let's hear uh, what your hot take. All right. So this pushed me into a loophole of the idea that in North America, we live in a society of cars. Like... Cities seems to be built for cars and not for people, yes. right? And like, here's an example. When you think of roads, they're continuous in the sense that when you're driving your car, you don't need to stop at like sidewalks and stuff. Like, or sorry, let's reverse it. If you're on the sidewalk and you're walking, you uh, at one at some point you're gonna have to stop, look both ways, and then cross an intersection, right? And when you cross onto a road, the road is dipped down, so you have to walk onto the road, and then, and then once you cross the road, you dip back up and onto the sidewalk. It's almost like you're entering another zone, like that road, right? So in a sense, sidewalks are disjointed, that you have to enter another section uh, of zone to get to the other, to get to where you need to go if you want to stay on the sidewalk. Whereas cars don't have that issue. Because car roads aren't continuous. Like you can, you, when your car's on the road, it stays on the road basically the whole way through, right? You never need to drive onto a sidewalk. I'm getting so hype for this upcoming day. <laughs> I'm a bit confused, but go on. <laughs> okay, well, what's what's the confusion? Because if you're confused, maybe the viewers are confused. I can almost guarantee that they are. <laughs> um. I don't know. I, I just don't get the point. Okay, so I thought, no, that, that's why I'm. <laughs> He's getting there. He's you. getting to the crescendo. So the okay. Here's the thing. Why do we need to look both ways before we cross the road? The climax. That's, that's the issue, right? Like, why why aren't sidewalks continuous and and cars are more where cars have to like climb up to a sidewalk to cross it? Why why don't we live in a world like that? Right? Wouldn't that be safer for? people because for people because you have to cross a road and look both ways you become a pedestrian and pedestrian are like their fatality has increased in in time like car wait, wait, wait. car oh, killing wait, wait. people car wait, killing wait. people in general hasn't has decreased right uh, but pedestrian has increased that's like, on the in infrastructure of the city i mean it's cheaper to make dis sidewalks disjointed rather than having to make uh 
uh, sidewalks continuous and then have a little bridge going under the sidewalk for cars or over the sidewalk <laughs> for cars well, at, at every see. intersection. Right. So, so I, my argument that, is uh, that. No, oh, sorry, Jason. That's... I was going to say it's easier for people to make a little step up onto the sidewalk than a car would to take a step up because. Right. But people can you, take you guys. Steps mindset right now is based on a, a car society where roads are built or the city is built for cars like car centric but where here. everyone needs a car right because like if you think of how neighborhoods are built like think of loops cul-de-sacs and stuff right why are suburban like areas have these loops and cul-de-sacs like none of these roads are joined together like a grid like downtown most downtowns they're grid like right so it's very it's more walkable when your city when your uh, area is built like a grid because things are connected so you can go to places right but if if you have all these cul-de-sacs you always have to go out of a cul-de-sac and then you have to walk really far to another section of the road right nothing is joined together and everything on the map looks like they look really wonky, right? But the reason they can do that is because we all have cars. But assuming if we didn't have cars, living in the cul-de-sac would suck. Because it would take you forever to get to anywhere. Wait, okay. So <laughs> what are you proposing that would be better? <laughs> so what I'm proposing, well, this is a huge issue. Um, proposing is that we build the city to move for people. So we focus on how do we transport people, right? Because, you know, people aren't like car people, bike people, like walking. Like people don't really care how they get to some place. They just care how fast they get there and how convenient it is, right? So, for example, like if your city had a lot of traffic, but the train is on a, like, on a rail or something or underground and your train is never is in traffic, then it might be faster for you to get to places through a train than it is through a car, right? And if that was the case for you, you would want to, you would opt into taking the train. And if it's the case for a lot of people, more people will take the train. And by more people taking the train, you would lessen the amount of cars that you would need on the road. So the idea is that we need to focus on building a city where we can move people and give them options like bikes, walking, trains, and cars, I guess. Okay, sure. But like, okay, sure. If cars. you're building new cities, yeah, that's easy enough. If if they're, you know, if they're, if they're really committed to building a new city, but most of the time these are just existing cities that already are built uh, by uh, car roadways, primarily. Yeah, right? and and you could argue that, but like even like when we're talking about the Dutch example uh, in the beginning, they started like that too. They started with roads and cars and stuff, but they made the conscious decisions of, you know, narrowing the roads and then making it, making more bike paths and just focusing on how to make a, a C focus on like bikes and walkability. Right. Well, hold on. This is and just they my... got a lot, got rid of a lot of the roads. Hmm? What happened? This is just my just this is just my oh. fucking casual brain. I can hear you, this. but there was a big oh, silence. Did I cut off. Can you hear me again? Oh yeah, I heard that as well. Our infrastructure is just uh, falling apart. Um, but anyways, back to the whole Dutch thing. Uh, I don't think Amsterdam was uh, originally built for cars. You know what I mean? I think it was. It, it started off as a pretty much walking town city. It's pretty old. Isn't if you it? look, it be, if like, you look at their old old. photos, they do have photos where it's like traditional, like what we have, like wide roads and a lot of cars being parked. Well, no, I mean, like the city. It, yeah, they'll they'll have the areas where they Ancient built up. Though. Yeah, they have the areas where they built up, you know, for the car. But the city started off as a city where people walk around, like medieval city, medieval European city. Well, like yeah, but like all cities, we all started with. Walking and then horses and carriages. No, 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 no. In... Not North American cities. North America. Well, we yeah. also start right at 
hit the cities hit the ground running basically you're already like a population of 100 150,000 and that's a small city whereas uh mm. you'll see you'll see this what you're talking about more in Europe because those are all they started as small mm. city they started as villages basically and then they grew you know those uh, municipalities have like history of two or two thousand years so they started at people when you know the whole city or the village comprised of like 20 people so of course it was made for people because they were just going to walk around to each other's places or to their businesses whatever i mean i get your point yeah and i get your point like obviously it's grown bigger and then when it was growing bigger and and they built a lot of sections for you know like car travel yeah they have the wide multiple lane roads and whatnot but i still think i mean i'm Unless you can convince me otherwise, you know, them starting off as a city, primarily like a walkable walk around city uh, that was built with a lot of that was made with just walking pedestrian traffic, basically. Uh, I mean, that that is different from a lot of, of North American cities that got primarily built up during the age of, you know, like more transportation, definitely the car era. Right. Yeah. Uh, so. I guess like one of the issues is that we're having now is urban sprawl, right? Or we're building communities further and further away from our center and we're stretching our infrastructure like like, you know, police and firefighters and stuff like that. And we're having issues of schools, right? Where we don't have enough schools. Yeah, where it's completely kids, screwed up, yeah. Right. And the issue is too is that like the whole comes back to like how we build our neighborhoods, like cul de sacs and stuff, because those take a lot of space, right? And like how we build. No, yeah, the whole suburb thing is basically exists only because of the car. And and yeah, the reason they can build cul de sac is because they assume people have cars because that's the yeah. only way you're gonna get to your house. And by having a car, and by building um suburb like suburban areas, you have this other rule called the uh, Euclidean zoning, which is a uh, urban planning thing. And basically, it's called it's called like it's in whenever you look at real estate map, they're usually yellow. And they call it the uh, yellow belt or whatever in Toronto. But basically, yellow, when you see yellow on a real estate map, it means it's a single house dwelling. So those single homes generally have the big yard and big roads and stuff, right? Or big yard and all that. And so what happens is houses need more room to be built further apart. And by building it further apart, you make yourself further and further away from things like schools, things like convenience stores and stuff like that so like we live in an age where you couldn't even go to a convenience store without getting into your car right and we are so dependent on car that it just adds all these trouble because a car is not like the issue with cars is there's so, so many issues right there's the carbon emission that's the issue there's the idea that you need a parking space for your cars and so when you and then, so when you have a car and you're driving to places, now you're more attracted to places with parking. Now you're more attracted to places that are like more convenient, like a, a Costco or Walmart, where it has everything, right? Whereas if you live in like a more denser area and you can walk to places, then you can like go to several stores in your walk. Whereas when you're driving, you don't want to drive to six, seven places. You just want to drive one place, get all your groceries or whatever, and then you just want to go home. And so this is this is the culture that we're living in, this like car centric society. I don't completely agree with that, just because if you're going to multiple places and you're buying things, then where are you gonna you're gonna have to carry it everywhere. So it's like having a car, you would do that because you could just like put it in your car, put it in your trunk. Boom, so if debunked. I'm walking somewhere, I'd <laughs> no, prefer I'm to only just... go to one place. I'm just... Well, no, I I, I get what he's saying as well. Brian's and, uh... like saying, you know, like those places like like small towns in like in London or in England where, you know, you'd, you'd go to the corner store to pick up milk and then right next to it is another store where you can pick up your eggs. And yeah, then... your lifestyle will be kind of different. Yeah. Instead of going out for like uh, getting a fucking car trunk's worth of haul, you, you know, you'd make a lot more uh like micro smaller trips. trips yeah yeah 
Because you can, right? When you live in like a more denser area, you can do that. But I mean, like, I, I, I got a comment about that, but I, I kind of want right. to go back to something because it's kind of bugging me. You said about the sidewalks. You said you'd rather, mm-hmm. you'd rather expand and link all the sidewalks and have cars have drive over the sidewalks rather than pedestrians walk over roads, right? Correct. Yeah. So what the fuck would that example, even? But what the fuck would that even? Like people have to watch out for cars regardless. So no, yeah, wouldn't it just be? Too. Wouldn't it the just be like be okay? Cars. So well, no. I mean, like okay. So what I'm ha- have in my mind right now, and yeah. maybe this is what you can, uh, maybe something you say can change this. But the image that I get from it is basically yeah, expanded um, fucking pedestrian walkways. But you know, if you have a car going through these places or just you know like going past. People have to watch out for it, anyways, right? So yeah. I mean, like, you can't right. have, you're never gonna. You said like, oh, well, well, the pedestrians always have to watch for cars and whatnot. Why can't it be the other way around? But the yeah. other way around, it's it's not like the pedestrian can harm the car. The car harms the pedestrian, right? And even in the situation right now, with the with the sidewalks being disjointed, um, to the best of my knowledge, most cities still have the rule of you know the pedestrian has the right of way in those cases. So true. Pedestrian has the right of way. But, like, when you look at, like, North America, like, say you're crossing, like, I, when I was in California, I wanted to go to In-N-Out, but I didn't have a car because I'm a traveler. And I didn't want to pay for an Uber. So to walk to In-N-Out, it was like, I had to cross a freeway, right? And it was like a 30-minute walk. And so, like, when I had to cross a freeway, it's a huge intersection. We had to do that for Vegas. Right? So, yeah. like, like, it's so unsafe. Right. And so, okay, the idea is that when all the sidewalks are linked together, it would be the idea that when a car enters the sidewalk, they're the foreigner, right? They're the visitor. So they need to watch for the people crossing. Right. And so the people have right away and then the car would like inch over the sidewalk and drive over. Right. So they need to be more precautious. Whereas when pedestrians are on the road, right. Yeah, we're watching for the cars because we're the foreigner. And then the cars are like, hurry up, grandma, cross the road so I can drive past this light or whatever, right? Well, they have, and... they have places. They, there's a lot of places that are like that, you know, like where it would be a big um, kind of like square where people walk to and from and then some cars can drive through. Yeah, and, and, just... and we have that here too, right? Like in our city center, there's that um, SF. Where people, where cars drive onto the sidewalk, right? Or is primarily uh, people walking on, and cars can go on top of it. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's just it's just slower for the car. Like, if they would rather, they'd rather not drive through those places. Ex- yeah, exactly. They don't want to drive through those places, and and that's the issue because a lot of fatalities, when you think of cars and fatality, it's all involving speed, right? The reason why we don't have a continuous sidewalk. It's because it would slow cars down too much, right? If cars have to, like, every time they meet a sidewalk, they have to slow down to go over, like, a huge speed bump just to go drive again. Yeah, yeah. And that's And that's the issue because when cities build streets or buildings, they all look at call, uh, LOS, level of service, and they look at, like, well, how, how does this impact this road and how often do cars have to stop and et cetera, right? And, that, and that's what how city planners look at things. They look at, like, how does this affect roads? And how does this affect the flow of traffic? So Where they don't be, look... What would be, like, uh, your your take on this? What would they need to look like? Because from what I'm getting from this is you mm-hmm. get rid of those smaller streets, and it's just it just seems like it would just be car expressways that stop somewhere, and then they'd have to get out and walk to whatever... Um, if, if the interior of whatever area they're in. To, to yeah. So, so what I'm okay. So there's a couple ideas. Um, first, there's this paradox where the idea, like you know, when people are saying like, "Oh, there's too much traffic in my city. They need to build more roads." Mm-hmm. That's the same analogy as someone saying, "I need to dye it by buying a bigger belt," right? Because by adding more roads to more lane mm-hmm. to a road, you don't you don't lessen the traffic. You just add more traffic. Because more cars are going to be coming in, right? The, the best way to reduce traffic is you need to make alternative transportation uh, more feasible 
than cars, meaning it needs to be more advantageous to take a bus than drive your own car. Because at that point, once people realize, oh, it's faster to take the train, that's how you get traffic to reduce because people will take the train and less cars will be on the road, right? You can't just build lanes to improve traffic. And they found that if you take away lanes, it actually improves traffic because you make, you make the congestion so bad, people just don't want to drive, right? You're, so that's the idea. So you need to basically look at building different transportation. So when we look at the Dutch, they have a huge network of bikes or um, bike roads. So a lot of their bike um, paths don't actually cross any car intersections. There are, there are bike paths that are only for bikes too, right? So, and you can get to like places like Ikea, like big, like super mall centers just through a bike. And they have huge like biking parkades and stuff like that. So everyone there prefers to bike because cars in Dutch, one of the challenges, because it's not car centric, a lot of the roads are kind of convoluted, right? They're not as straightforward to get to A and B. So you have to drive around a lot of one ways and and over obstacles to get to where you are. But you still can drive a car for like when you're saying moving a furniture, but it wouldn't be the primary choice for you to drive a car in that city. And so when we look at North America, not only is car our primary choice, it's becoming our only choice. Because if you live in like a really new developed like neighborhood, you have no choice but to drive. All right, but let me ask this then. Okay, fair mm-hmm. enough. Like, yeah, you let's just let's just say, yeah, fair enough for uh, pedestrian traffic and uh, people um, just driving cars to get wherever. Um, but what about like the way? What about like logistics? What about like trucks that carry cargo and stuff? Like the way the, these cities are made is that they can access these places. So if you take that away, um, you know, there's there's gonna be a big shift in how. A lot of like it's right. It's not. It's never like sense. everything stays the same, right? Whenever yeah. like you change something, especially in economics, they say you know like they keep all the other variables constant to see like a difference. But right. when you want to apply it to the real world, like the, a ripple when you change something, there's yeah, there's a ripple. So if you if right now it's built in a way where all the trucks they can access whatever like you know small businesses they have pull up areas for trucks to deliver the cargo that they need, whatever, right? If you're a restaurant, you have a place where a truck can come in, back up, unload and everything, right? You Costco and Ikea, Walmart, they all exist in this sort of way because they all utilize, utilize the roadways and the parking lots. So if you have it in, yeah, it's more train-centric and stuff, you know, like, what, do, what would you do with cargo? Like, how would they get their stuff? Right. And, and you know, I'm not the... City planner. I just watched a YouTube video, <laughs> but like, yeah. There, well, there I know, but we I would d- have to reconsider. And like, I guess there are a bunch of benefits, like uh, that I'm talking about. But there are like the things that we have to consider is like, well, how do we get freight and stuff? So perhaps they would be on different parts of the city where they're closer to highways and stuff, right? But like, I guess in the idea, the idea is that if um, you want to focus on areas where people live, right? Where that's where you want to change how things are structured, right? So, like, we need to... Right, but right now... The, okay, so right now the way people live, let's talk about just, like, suburb neighborhoods, right? Because Can I just all clarify about... something? Yeah. Just so I get a better picture of how this city would be planned, are you saying that there would be no, like, uh, commercial zones and residential zones and just kind of, like, Right. So zoning, zoning laws, the issue is that we just, in North America, we took it too far, where we took the R1 zoning, which is single house, and we made it that like only single house can be built, right? Like, we need to kind of mix it up where we can add like, like, you know, multi-level or multi-housing projects as well. And, you know, there's arguments people are like, oh, then they're just going to build these condo skyscraper beside like a single home family home. Right. And that's not the case because, you know, people don't people won't want to build a skyscraper beside houses. But if you look at like Paris, they have kind of like a mid-level kind of housing, like a row house or townhouse. They have all these like different type of multi-family housing. Right. So you would have a mix of stuff. 
And then we need to add like more things like corner stores or like commercial areas within like housing. So or within like our housing community. So we don't need to drive to a convenience store when we could just walk to one or like a house that's converted into one, you know, like there are part older parts in our city that has this where you ha- where you see a community and then there's like a restaurant. Right. And that's because there's they're grandfathered into the zoning law. But because of our standards that we have set, it's really hard for us to change how we build our city because we set these standards and we're following the rules. But by following the rules, we're actually making our city worse by issues such as what I'm talking about, like this urban sprawl, right? Like our city has always had this problem. And, you know, our mayor has said, you know, he would fix this, but he never really had the power to. Well, and we still have this issue. Yeah, they can't do shit. And a lot of the <laughs> cities on North America, they can never do shit. But um, right, <laughs> I was just playing devil's advocate for you. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of familiar with these things. And I, 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 a lot of places in Asia are what I kind of described before. And I know kind of, I have an idea of how they kind of solve that freight problem. <laughs> so oh, I basically, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. oh you no, trapped me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I I was trying to play devil's advocate. Well, they they have those. Are you talking about those like Japanese buses or not Japanese? No, so those Japanese trucks. Those no, square... no, no. So, uh, some other places in the world where they did have the political will and the capital to uh, build, basically rebuild a bunch of shit in their cities, even ancient cities. You can probably see this in China, Korea, Japan, and etc. In those places where. Um, they may they build an area where it's supposed to be one of those like, um, like air, I don't know what you call them. You have everything, all the amenities are around you. So, uh, your grocery stores, restaurants, whatever they you know like in your area, in your neighborhood, sort of deal. But how the freight gets there is basically like a freight point. So, um, it's either by road traditionally, but if you're in those areas where it's mostly like walking paths. Like, you know, if you go to China, if you go to, like, uh, Shanghai's, like, um, what's it called? Nanjing Lu, or if you go to Beijing's Wangfujing, you know, there's no, there's not really places outside for cars to park inside the shopping uh, squares. What it usually is, is they just have it underground. They have the distribute, they have the freight um, get unloaded underground or on the sides, and they kind of, like, wheel it into all the restaurants and shops that need it. So that's how they kind of do it that way. Underground is one of the ways you can you can make it so everything on top is will just be like a big, massive, you know, civilian walking square with maybe some train stations. And then when they need to get their freight, the trucks go underground to unload, offload, and then they okay. get the freight everywhere else. That's uh, that's smart. Like the last thing I. But I just wanted to hear. I wanted to hear you fucking flubber and be like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that was, well, I that's what it, route. That's why it was worth it. it. That's what it was worth it to me. I would just take the political route. Either tell a lie or just say nothing. <laughs> but but okay. But that's actually, I, I I fucking trolled you. But um, the the issue itself is not really a troll where we live because where we live there isn't the fucking political will or the capital. Just like you said that. Um, they're willing to do these changes, right? This that costs they, them a lot of money. They make meaningless changes. Like, for example, there's a Facebook post saying, "Like, hey, we need to reduce the speed in our community. We want to reduce the yeah, exactly. residential speed to 40, right? Yeah, okay. might as well just might as well just get all the cars to drive at 10. <laughs> so here's <laughs> With the their issue. logic. Here's the issue. The reason cars drive 100 kilometers through a school zone is not because there's no school sign or a playground sign. Uh, what the reason is, is that roads are wide and straight. It allows cars to drive 100 kilometers. If you make roads narrower, if you add one ways, if you add speed bumps, if you add build, uh, like buildings closer to the road, right? like objects, like trees and stuff, drivers will have to drive slower because the roads are more complex. That's how you calm a road or calm traffic. You make the road more complex. You make it windier. You just make it difficult for someone to drive 100 kilometers straight down, right? That's how you calm. But by saying like, oh, we're just going to change the law and make it 40. Yeah, that's not going to do shit because people are not going to remember. And it's really hard because when you're driving, sometimes you just forget how fast you're going just because of 
like you're just focused on something else, right? And because of how our roads are designed, it's easy to speed on a playground zone. Where it's very difficult to speed in a playground zone if it was winding and there's like, you know, pylons everywhere. You yeah, but you're kind of putting the cart before the horse because all of this is built already because based on you know all these uh the way the roads are right now and when people yes want to get yeah. somewhere they will take these roads because they they, they want to get somewhere so i exactly. mean like if you're thinking oh it, you know it'd be much more efficient just to narrow the the roads physically instead of putting up signs and whatnot well people still are like well what the fuck i still need to, this road to get home i mean like you they can will make it... so so either they avoid the road which accomplishes what you're doing, which is calming the traffic. But it doesn't or accomplish they, what they're doing, where it's just like, you know, getting to where they want to be. Right, but they, they don't want to avoid the road. If you if you say, like, let's say you took a big road yeah. and you want to calm it because it's in the neighborhood, you make, you make, like, you make it narrower by making it, say, a one-way, mm-hmm. and you make it narrower by adding bike lanes on the sides. Uh-huh. Or what if you even, you know how, like, in some areas in close downtown, there's a community where... There, sometimes a road gets cut off and just says like, "Oh, no entry." Yeah, and you have to like but drive then around those, it. Those those drivers that usually take that road, they'd have to take another road. So exactly. then you basically overload the other road. Yeah, you, you do. But like the <laughs> idea is, that's how you calm a road effectively. But you, but you just you just shift the congestion somewhere else where the other place gets congested now. Someone else's right. Problem. But like the other congestion might be okay because it's not near homes, right? Where kids are playing or like where families are sleeping okay but like you're still causing congestion somewhere like you you're gonna get these problems where the other road gets congested then all of a sudden you know these people are gonna find somewhere else to go so you know like they they again you get them spilling into fucking places where it's like residential area you and then and you push the problem to someone else but what i'm trying to say in this argument is that effectively to calm a road you can't just change the law or add a new road sign <laughs> that doesn't do anything what i'm saying is to what what would be effective is what i'm saying but like my my solution will piss people off it will <laughs> like anger people but it is effective it works is what i'm trying to sell well it's kind of like hey you really want it your your solution is hey you really want people to drive at 30 kilometers you do this but then the whole thing is people are not just fucking jonesing to drive at 30 kilometers an hour they're just wanting to fucking drive in some place. You know, they just want to. Right. But like take the same the people, the same people are not, they don't care about the 40 limit. Like those aren't the people that we're talking about. The top, the people who, who want cars to be drive slowly are probably the parents of their kids who my kids play on this playground or play on this, on the neighborhood street. And I don't want these cars speeding at them. Right. Those are the parents that are concerned and they might be, they're probably more persuaded in the solution of what's effective versus changing the law. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. I'm so if you were part of the like the screaming parents, the the, the, the screaming mad, parents the at the speeding car <laughs> lobby, yeah, you know, you could, yeah, you you could probably fucking go bat for them. Um, but for the larger picture of you know like, what do you do about a car centric city, an uh, outdated car centric city? How do you make it? much less dependent on car travel that wouldn't that thing wouldn't do much about and, that right? and that's i think and it's a challenge right because like when you're when your whole source of your issue is that you design a city based on cars and to suddenly change it it's gonna be a lot to change like everyone's you're changing everything right because we're so everything that we when we buy a house where we live and all that yeah, it would all change. It all depends on cars, right? Like when I bought my place, my realtor is like, oh, yeah, it only takes you uh, 20 minutes to get to the main highway or 10 minutes to get to the main highway. Like it's all about how fast can you get to the artery of something. But you never said like, oh, yeah, it will take you two hours to take transit to get to downtown, right? right? It would never sell you that because it's just ridiculous. But that's <laughs> what that's the situation we're living in, that you have no option but to have a car. And that's I think the you got to move forward, though. I think your proposal of making all these changes to how communities are built, that's an option for, like, newer places. But for pretty much all these major cities and stuff, it's 
a forward path would be to look towards future technology. So like uh, auto auto cars, basically, where I wouldn't even go that far. I think you just build like a subway system. You already you already well, kick yeah, off a lot. It's like advancing transportation, though, to a point where you could basically take these cars. They drive automatically, drop you off where you have to go, and then they just piss off. You don't have to park and stuff. So it frees up congestion. It You wouldn't need all the space for like parking lots and stuff like that. And plus, you get to go wherever you want by a car. So where people that... After Sorry? They drop, where do the cars go after they drop you off? They still have to go somewhere. The future, I imagine, if you own it, it could go back to your house. Otherwise, if it's like a company, because I imagine tons of companies like Uber and stuff will say they'll have just cars automatically going from picking up one passenger, dropping them off, going to another passenger, that kind of idea. You know, you know, it'd be great is if we all relinquish our ownership of cars and then have like a car all driven by AI network. Or you that's, can just have... That's what I dream of in the future. Or you can that just have the a best. fucking subway right now. <laughs> yeah, like sure you can you keep your car subway, and then also subway can't have a be built subway. overnight. <laughs> well, oh matter. yeah, but the fucking the the fucking autonomous car can be built overnight. <laughs> well, because cars, there would be an option because you can. It's a more viable option at least because if you want to go long distances, you don't need a giant ass train uh, railway that needs constant maintenance. Uh, plus, you know, with the car, you could do those shorter trips. With like buying groceries and everything, I don't, even buying furniture without needing to haul it onto a train. I don't doubt eventually that you're gonna get autonomous cars and you can do this, and then it'll you'll have to get the whole new infrastructure built instead of like parking lots for cars to park a long time. You're gonna have to have lanes where cars come to pick people and drop people off. You yeah. know, like I, I, yeah, sure that that's its own that's its own other developmental challenge. But what I'm saying right now is like, yeah, that'll be in the future because you can't have that right now. But what you can have right now and and can be done and basically alleviates most of the things that most of the problems that Brian said, right? And also, you know, relieves pretty much all the problems if you have the money is you just build up a subway system in your city. And oh, which in I, our I, city, I, that is not an option, apparently. So like you know, what Zinzin's saying makes sense because... For metro to work efficiently, it can't be behind traffic, meaning buses need their own roads, right? Because it doesn't make sense for a bus to be stopped in traffic with other cars. Because at that point, people on the bus will be like, fuck, why am I on this bus when I could be driving, right? Because then at least you could choose to be stuck in other roads, right? So like when you're taking a subway, the best thing is that because it's on its own track, it's never stuck behind behind traffic. Yeah, it's it doesn't compete for road space. With it doesn't surface. compete for road space, and therefore, you can be it be consistent, right? Because like if you take metro in our city, you have to check the schedule to figure out when the bus comes or when the train comes, and if you have to check the schedule, it's a it's a sign that the system has failed. Because the idea is that if you you shouldn't need to check the schedule where you just get to the train station or get to the bus station, and there's enough frequent cars or carts that can just take you. So you never need to check when the tr- next train is coming. Especially That's... in a city where there's fucking winter that comes on for half the year and yes. fucking destroys like the train schedule if there's a there's, there's even just like a couple, <laughs> you know, hours of snowfall. Well, what That's else? The pro- the problem living in Yukon, right? <laughs> what I was talking about is we in the city we're living in, there's been a talk about making a train go to basically where I am, where I live. Yeah. But that's been in talks for several, several years. And at this point, it's basically never going to happen. Yeah. But, you know, like once they do the like when they when the autonomous car technology rolls out in the you know, fucking decades away or, or whatever. Right. You're still going to have that same kind of like um, institutional fucking uh, 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 inertia. Right. Because to get all of that running at full capacity, you're going to have to still make changes to a lot of the city, right? And then they're going to have to look into, like, oh, will the cost be worth it that much? How many people are going to have to buy fucking autonomous cars? You need to reach some saturation point for us to even make sense that, you know, you got to spend all this money to, you know, like, um, have, you know, like, just like what I said, like, pick up drop-off points or whatever, right? Like, you know, like, if they, they're going to go, they're going it, to, it's not going to be, like, 
cheaper or some more like uh or cost worthy than thinking about all the things that you could do today. It's going to be the same. Like if they're if they're like shitting themselves and fucking over a train line on an above ground train line, they're going to be shitting themselves about everything. Like everything that comes along, any new technological revolution that comes along in regards to transportation, they're also going to be wringing their hands around that. And even though like I I wouldn't I wouldn't let it I wouldn't say that the current infrastructure is set up for anything, even if it's car centric right now. Anything that brings any kind of new change in like the paradigm or how people move around, uh, like if if people are just stuck in the mindset where it's like, you know, this costs too much money, this takes too long, you know, we got to deliberate and shit. It's always it's it's going to be a problem for everything. Yeah, I heard myself repeat too. <laughs> okay. I keep on hearing it actually. Oh no, it's better now. I think Craig is fucking with us. I think oh, sorry. Maybe I can't variety. hear anything. Oh, you can. Hear it? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, the quality's so bad. Wait, did it, did you just did nobody hear my entire thing? I did heard it, but I heard the uh, weird like quick other voice of yours or something. The phantom voice. I heard that too. You went chipmunk for a second. It sounded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I missed the chipmunk then. I oh. didn't hear. But didn't you heard hear everything it. before then, right? Oh, uh, I heard hmm. that, but I saw Brian's uh, icon light up, so I don't know if something happened with his phone or something. I wasn't talking. Oh. Yeah, I know you weren't talking, but I saw that your thing lit up, so don't know if that feedback from Zins was from your phone or something. Oh, well, it's, 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 it's lost to him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I agree. It's <laughs> what I would say. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's all I have for my rant. That's my hot take. Like, yeah. I agree. Like, we can't do anything. Like, the city I live in is a car-centric, and I just have to live with having a car, owning a car, maintaining a car, finding parking for my car. Yeah. Everything. It's it's the city's built for my car. It's not a city for me. That's all. So if they built a new city... As you have mentioned, where it's like all these commercial mixed with residential areas and stuff like that, so you have a bunch of stores within walking distance. Would you move to a city like that then? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would definitely consider that. Like, it'd be great to not own a car and be able to get everything that you need. Because, like, for bigger stuff, you could always deliver it too, right? So, be, be. Better. Well, cities like that have are but have, based all, have existed on what you for a long said, time. Based on what true. you said, you'd there would also be the trade off that you'd live in a house that would be more like the, the houses would be basically smaller. Yeah, you'd have either condos or like townhouses or something, or right. you'd live next to a store or something like that. Well, like I'm a minimalist, so I would enjoy living in houses like those. I mean, like you could just fucking move to like fucking Tokyo, Manhattan. You yeah. know, Shanghai, right. wherever, like those places, Seoul. You know, they're they're all like that. Yeah, the problem is, is like they're just people are living like that because it's so expensive. It'd be nice to like live in that, but still be like, oh, I still have a lot of free flowing cash. You know. Yeah, but that's the whole fucking re- like the way the society, the way the whole uh, social economics is 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 because those places will always be more expensive. That's just how it is. Like you're not going to be living cheaply like yeah they're built up that way because they had need because yeah. of the, the the value that you know they fucking they, so it's they, almost they like people up. want to live in areas that's more walkable where things are more convenient well, or close by in those wow. situations where there are major cities is kind of forced upon it but like the alternative would be if you live in like a small town where it's like that i don't but see a middle you won't have that that's the whole point. You won't have that because a small town does not have that accumulation of capital enough. Like you yeah. can live in Manhattan. What? Are, why are all the prices like? Like it's because it has been fucking hoovered up that way. That way you can have all your living amenities nearby, right? But you know the cost is exactly that. Everything, all the prices are much higher. Like your standard, your cost of living is much higher to live in those places just because of the way it is. You can't have that in the middle of fucking nowhere. Like the Yukon, you can't have like a Manhattan in the middle of the Yukon. 
Right? Yeah, I was nothing. imagining like a kind of Wild West kind of town where it's like you have the saloon there and next door is like the freaking general store and well, stuff like, like that. I guess you, like that's going to be a car centric town, though, right? In the in modern the future, era, yeah, that's, in the modern era, that's a car centric. It has town. to be I, frozen in time at that state. I guess what I'm thinking of like areas like Japan or Amsterdam where people can like bike to a train station. Like in Japan, if you a lot of people who don't live in Tokyo, they live in areas outside of Tokyo. They yeah. would just bike to a train station and then take the train to Tokyo to work, right? And unfortunately, with Japan, their work hours are kind of horrendous and their commutes are kind of ridiculous. But for the most part, it's very healthy. Whereas, like in Amsterdam, it's also most people bike to work, right? Yeah. And they have dedicated bike lanes. Uh, all their traffic signals are all independent and stuff like that. Like, here's an issue. Like, when I'm talking about car-centric uh, North America, our pedestrian lights, like, you know when you press it and sometimes it doesn't change the light and, like, but the traffic light is green, like, you could cross the, cross the sidewalk or cross the road, but if you did, you technically would be jaywalking because the sign didn't say you're allowed to walk, even though no cars were going to go to your lane anyways. But because you didn't press it in the time frame they allowed you or the time frame where it would switches, it doesn't register it. Like that's a that's a design flaw because they're like like that's a design flaw and and that's also a design where they they do that on purpose because they don't want you to cross so cars can start turning on your onto that road, right? So they <laughs> okay. they they designed it where they they're prioritizing cars over pedestrians. Yeah, because the city is prioritizing the car over right. And like when I was in California walking to in and out, there was like maybe two or three other people walking on that sidewalk. The sidewalk was empty. Like, it's not a walk. Like, they built a sidewalk just in case someone might want to walk in and out. But really, no one really walks in and out. They all drive. So, in that situation, wouldn't, they just, wouldn't it just be better to take out the sidewalk? <laughs> yeah. In, <laughs> in that case, a, they might, you could, you they turn might this as well. Turn, turn, turn it into an anti sidewalk rant. Like I, I want to. I wonder if Bizarro O'Brien in the alternate universe is right now is arguing against sidewalks, and he's like, more people places should be against for just fucking all car, just completely pro car. Get rid of all sidewalks. No, yeah, think- have no one ever walking. Just have cars everywhere. And then they he brings out, and then Bizarro O'Brien brings out the in and out, and it's like fucking like there was a sidewalk. No one's even walking on it. What the fuck? Just take out that sidewalk. Put another lane. More cars to go in. Like, this I can see actual Brian saying that, not even a Bizarro Brian. <laughs> but, but, I... but Bizarro Brian in that same example in, in, in Bizarro World, he would say that and then he would say something about like, oh, there's a there's an empty road that no one really takes. Why don't you just take that? <laughs> he, he'll catch himself in the, same, in the same thing where he just accidentally argues uh, the opposite. <laughs> like ideally, that. the best thing is these modes of transportation should be all in their own world. Like... Cars should exist on roads where there you don't need to share it with bikers and and pedestrians. Where you could just share it with cars. Yes, and just sidewalks like sidewalks should be just shared with people walking and just bike, like Coruscant, place. right? The layered, you know, in Star Wars, Coruscant, the the the, the planet of like uh, the Galactic Republic and the, the and the Empire, the capital, right? You had like multiple layers, right? On the bottom layers is all the fucking slums and people walking. And then, you know, you got people on the other layers and then, you know, and, but they also have like, you know, flying cars and transportation like that. You could, could you, I, I wonder, like, what, what do you think about this kind of future city where, you know, like all the current infrastructure, the roads, the sidewalks and everything, that's layer one. What if they decided to do something that kind of like Chicago did where they just build another new city on top of the old city? What happens if it's like, the well, layer like on a, top. The layer on like top. Futurama. You're yeah. About. Layer on top. Cars and shit, or or, or whatever, right? Or layer like on the bottom. Metro layer in the middle. Walking people layer on top. Cars and shit. What See, the you... problem problem with that is you're you're segregating money at that point, right? Because then now you have a classes issue. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's not really segregating money, but yeah, exactly. You, you're gonna get a class issue. Well, of like, course. and that's that's the issue with modern transportation we have in North America. Like, people don't think of bus as a a convenient way to get to work. They look at it as the poor man's way of getting to work, right? Like, they look at it like, oh, you take the bus to work, you must be a 
peasant, whereas I drive my Mercedes or my Audi, right? That's unfortunately is also a class issue. I and that's, honestly, that's something we need to change. Yeah, on it. No, honestly though, I think that's what people would want if the if the urban development technology ever reaches that part. I think people would want to build cities like that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever side you're on, they're gonna get to that point where they're gonna level it. They're gonna think, you know, like fuck, we build apartments to put people level on top of each other on one, you know, uh, on one fucking square area. You know, they'll think, why don't we apply that to transportation as well? You already do it for the subway. Why don't you mm-hmm. do it for cars and people? I think people are gonna go towards that. You have the opposite in some Canadian cities, right? You mm-hmm. have the walkways between the between the buildings. But, oh, you're talking about like yeah, yeah. like the little connections. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're they're cool. So you could probably have something like that. I guess you, you. I guess technically that's also layering, right? Because the people who work or who walk in those um, corridors, they tend to be like in the indus- like the energy industry, where they're they where they're like execs and stuff, right? Well, in yeah, companies not... that are higher. Yeah, but it's not income. like it's not like it's not like ubiquitous enough that you know people walking on the street level are fucking slums and shit. Right, <laughs> right but like they could take those too. You like you don't have to pay to use it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. The, but we the can whole get to that level. thing. Is, is that. We can get to that level where it's like, how much do you make? Oh, you're not the type of people that can walk inside our heated facility. You're gonna have to cross the road like a. Because, <laughs> because what I imagine is um. If it's not managed well, um, you could have it where it, the layer that is the most fastest or the efficient or whatever gets most of the capital sucked towards there, right? There will be there's gonna be a shift. See, right? that's where I was hoping it's wrong. Where it's like, there's places I, where I, this, uh, just hold on. There's there's places hmm. where that doesn't happen. Like if you compare the subway system of New York to the subway system of Korea or Japan, you see it's completely different, right? In New York, it's just, it's, pr- pr- it's pretty much a shithole, uh, the subway. It's like, when you get down, there's nothing. It's like, it's like you don't even want to take it at night because you, yeah, you, you might get mugged. Yeah. But you see the, the, the way they developed in, in uh, Japan or Korea is like the subway system is actually, you know, there's a lot of shops, there's a lot of restaurants well, and stuff. Like, people for kids, spend time. You're, for a kid, you can take the sub, uh, train by yourself. Um, at like age eight or something, like to yeah. go to school, and but even and more, it's so safe that you're it's fine. They don't, but even, they're not afraid of like abduction. But even more differentiated than that is like you actually have like a whole, you know, fucking uh, like a ecosystem down in the subways, right? Everything is, uh, it's not just barren, you know, underground dark tunnels. It's like See, that's what I imagine. Like if you're a rich person and say you want to take the car to work. And and by driving, it would take you 45 minutes. But if you took the train, it's only 10 minutes. Because you're rich, you're like, oh, yeah, I could spend 45 minutes in a car driving. <laughs> like, that's what I would hope. And then, like, the poor people is like, oh, I need to get to work. And I need to get there fast. And I need to take the train to be there 10 minutes. And that's the idea. Like, where you're so rich, you're like, oh, yeah, I don't need to do anything. I could just take my time to get to work anyways. <laughs> that's my ideal idea that's your ideal my ideal would be it wouldn't even be that distinction you could just go wherever you want <laughs> like you want to take the train you want to, to you want to drive it <laughs> you do it don't worry about it you're not gonna get mugged in either way if rich people took the time getting to work they wouldn't be rich most rich <laughs> most rich people are always you know like hurry 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 they're not gonna be like i'll take my time getting into it well they're just not enjoying themselves being rich i guess <laughs> i love ranting about the rich every time <laughs> but yeah it's it's an interesting problem i think there's a lot of facets and i think the reason i'm interested in this topic is just how our city has gone into its problem and like now i kind of understand why people want to make these rules like traffic calming or like we need to add bike lanes to our downtown it makes yeah sense. it's just it's it's just um just these stupid non solutions but just there's no other people kind of they're kind of like jaded by when they think about development in these cities that it takes just so much effort and so much there's so much is vitriol it just even talking about expanding a train line like people 
people get pretty like fucking insane about that shit. And, and then at the end, I think you just get you get people with these just really shitty solutions with these really small, worthless for them wins, but in you know like in the objective sense, just nothing, not non solution. People are just afraid of solution. change too. Yeah, like well, all yeah. the bike clean stuff and everything. They get, like people they... are opposed to it, even though it's like it doesn't change the amount of late uh, car lanes. Um, in most cases, it's just like it narrows it a bit, but people hated it because. So, so I read about statistics. stereotypes against bikers. I guess. I mean, it's so like... it's all just like an austere mindset, right? It's all born from that. Like people just just the smallest, not a fucking. <laughs> Just the smallest kind of material improvement. They're all like, they've mad, they've astonishingly just convinced themselves that that's a bad thing, right? Be, just, yeah. just, just conditioning themselves just because they see this. Oh, look how much hassle we have to go through just for these small things. Fine, let's let's get let's reduce the the roads the speed limit to like 30, 20, 20 kilometers or whatever, right? So stupid, here's... stupid fucking ideas. So, like, what Jason was talking about, like, converting a road by adding a bike lane. Like, here's the statistics of when people bike. Like, there's a uh, one percenter who are these um, any condition bikers who are, they will ride their bike through, like, traffic with cars and stuff because they're fearless, right? Mm. But that's a very small percentage. Then there's the enthusiast bikers who will bike on those converted road bike lanes, right? Because they feel like they're safe enough with these little bars beside the cars so that they they have this barrier but that's not a large percentage of bikers and then the biggest one would be um and those are like mostly adults right and then the biggest one is the bike lane is completely by itself and that's an all-age thing where it includes kids as well and that's like majority of the people who would bike would who would prefer to bike on right with like cars are nowhere in sight kind of thing so even with that converted bike lane, you're only you're only gonna have adults that would bike on it, and even then, a, only a fraction of bikers who would actually bike on it. So, I was just saying that people are upset about adding bike lanes because they're not they don't like change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they they're losing a parking spot, et cetera, et cetera. Which in our city we have the most expensive parking, so why would you even want to park there anyways? But I digress, Dan. <laughs> People might think we're in New York now. <laughs> Who says we're not? Who says we're not with our gigantic? We said we're not <laughs> multiple times, multiple episodes. <laughs> All right, so uh, we, that's my rant. Okay, I'll let someone take the floor now. <laughs> that was basically it. That was the main course. <laughs> Everything else after this is just winging it. <laughs> well, we could talk about homeless people. I was watching a small video on homeless people. All right, so let's talk about the homeless people. All right, they were what saying that. Well, um, they were saying that to battle the issue of homeless people, it depends on your view of the problem. Uh-huh. And just, so just there's two views. One view is homelessness is a, it's a state where people um, become homeless, but it's not a state that they can they stay in, like. Some, there's a statistic that says that people are, who are homeless, uh, on average, are homeless for like 60-some days, and then they're, they can get back on their feet and find shelter or whatever. So like, it's something that they, just be, they get into, but they don't, they don't, they're not chronic, right? Like, there's a, it's, not, it's not like every homeless person is a chronic issue where they're always homeless. It's only a like, majority of them are just homeless because of the situation they're in. Yeah, um, but I'm I'm wonder uh, I wonder how deep how thorough their stats are on this because if you just take a snapshot and mm-hmm. think, oh yeah, this guy's only homeless for X amount of time, maybe six months or a year. Um, mm-hmm. What do the what? majority of them after that period? What 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 is where do they end up? Like, is, are you, are they saying like, oh yeah, at the end of this temporary? Well, they say uh, they get homelessness. Back on their feet. Like, do they the, now? Well, the idea of um, homelessness is you're homeless if you don't have a consistent place to stay at night, right? So if you don't have a shelter consistently, then you're homeless. Like maybe they find a relative that they can stay with, that then they're no longer homeless. They technically don't own a home, but they're not homeless in that sense, Wait, right? Sorry, what did you say? A percentage of these people? Um, majority. Of, I didn't say a percentage, but like majority 
of homeless people, they say, are not chronic homelessness. Like they don't stay homeless. They tend to find a way out, whether it's assistance from the government or by themselves. Like people find a solution to their situation, I guess. How um, many days was that? 60, you said? It, it depends on sex and family. Um, like 60, I think, was the average between all of them. Something on there, right? Um, <laughs> so basically, the first, view, the first view is you view them as a, a condition where people can get anyone, it can happen to anyone kind of thing. So you see them, you treat them as a human being kind of thing, right? The other way of viewing as homelessness is a nuisance. You, you don't want them on, in front of your uh, storefront. You just want to get rid of them. Yeah, you, don't, you... you don't care how the city gets rid of them. You just don't want them sleeping in front of your place. That's the idea, right? And so the solution that people found most, or research has found most effective is that it's called housing first solution, where the idea is that you need to get people who are homeless into a house somewhere that they can stay uh, overnight and get them off the streets, basically. You need to find them some, some type of housing that they can live in. And then, like permanent or temporary? Temporary. Because the idea is that they're homeless for that temporary moment, but you need to protect them, and you need to prevent them from getting on the streets. That's the idea. Like One is to prevent people from becoming homeless. So ways of eviction and stuff. Because like, uh, when you look at, they say that homelessness, a lot of it is caused by like domestic domestic issues or like evictions and stuff like that. So if you can prevent it where if someone's evicting, they have a place that they can go stay during that transition period without the streets, that will help them a lot, right? Oh my god, yeah. I'm, so This is all just fucking um, <laughs> skin rash fucking solutions, you know, like uh, right. keep on going. Okay, so I already other, despise this study. <laughs> the other criteria. Of I don't believe it first. so far. No, the okay, other... so it's, it's but it's done by a bunch of fucking asshole. It's done by a bunch of fucking oh, it's it's, it's like, it's like people. It's basically they never. It's done by people that are you know that saying where it's like a whole bunch of blind people are touching an elephant and they're like oh this is what an elephant is you know like because they can only describe what they're touching they can never describe what an actual elephant looks like because they can never step back and you know fucking. Or, you know, they can't see, but you don't have one guy going through touch the entire elephant to get, oh, this, it has a trunk, it has a tusk. It, no, it's just like, oh, an elephant is just these three, is just this fucking leathery skin. Or it, they touch a leg, it's like, oh, an elephant must look like a stump, like a tree or whatever, right? Sounds like these fucking researchers, that's all they did. They touched the ass of the elephant and they're like, yep, I think we got it. <laughs> well, I like, think we got the whole picture. <laughs> the other idea, the other thing is that you, um, I guess... The other issue where housing first, like there are places that try to implement this, but they, they add criteria to things like, oh, yeah. you need to be sober to live here or this you is can't a, be addiction this is a, and stuff. This is an American study. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's done in America. Like yeah. things for California and stuff where they have huge issues with homelessness. Yeah. Like, it sounds like, like a very issue. Democrat in scope. Well, our city very specific. Our city kind of proposed that, right? Our because, city is also can be very democratic because they were saying that because with the COVID pandemic, people aren't staying in hotels. What if we use all these hotels to house these homeless people? That's the idea, mm-hmm. right? So the idea is that you can't add conditions, right? Because you can't say like, oh, just because you're over, you're you're addicted to drugs, you can't live in these free homes, right? Because the reason they're addicted is because they're living on the streets. If you give them the home, the idea is that they can get better in that situation whereas if you like put the stipulation then it just causes the issue to be worsened um <laughs> anyways completely agree oh yeah with that. yeah of course <laughs> but they they but they completely miss like the big fucking obvious thing in the, that's in front of their eyes right you have all this excess literally excess capacity for homes for people to live in and yet you have this huge homeless problem right you can yeah. you anybody can look at this and be like yeah, there's something fucking wrong, but it's not like some there's, fucking boutique solution. You're talking about you're talking about the affordable home solution. No, I'm talking about the whole fucking thing, the whole base of the, what the society is. If you already have an excess amount of production, but you have excess amount of homeless, you know, fucking look at it. Look, look, like put it your left and right hand out together and be like, ha ha. <laughs> look at this fucking mess. It's like this is this is this is a shit show already. Like like and and you're and. 
the thing I hate about all this all this research, all these like surface skin rash researches, is usually like, oh, you know what? I think you know, like this. They test out this really lukewarm hypothesis where it's usually something that's just like a band aid, or it's like, yeah, let's have let's have temporary housing with no conditions or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, fucking, that's great from where it is currently, but literally, this it's like the guy has fucking um, bone eating fucking. <laughs> it's like the guy got shot, and his guts are all messed up, and then you're just putting a band aid over the cut, right? You're not even addressing the fucking. The shredded guts underneath. But you're what well, you're talking about is the whole uh, inequality issue, right? The whole fucking society, the yeah. But that's society issue. But this is like me con- trying to convert a car centric city into a walking centric city. That's I, yeah, I didn't like say that level. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know the thing is, yeah, well, no, because I told you I agreed with you. I'm like, this is a thing. This is a car centric. It's like a development problem. It's the origin of development, right? And then you you can't do you can't do much about it even if you're talking about like um, fucking making places more friendly for pedestrians you know like instead of doing road signs that are you know shitty speed limiting road signs you gotta put you know like you have to change how the road is and whatever deep like I agree with you with that that deeper part of like yeah the whole city fundamentally kind of needs to change. This is the same type of deal. This whole fucking paradigm needs to fucking change. Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go on. I'll, I'll rant about it more once you're done I with this whole thing. I, I'm basically done. Well, like, okay. the other thing the other thing is, like, people who see homeless people as a nuisance. Yeah. We just we just put them in jail, and, and then the problem's solved. Yeah, of course, have of course, problem solved. Yeah, that's that's working so great. I mean... Th- well, I mean, that's what America does. So that's why they arrest people just to take drugs right rather than arresting drug dealers they just arrest the 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 users sometimes. yeah well that's all chicken and egg shit right like why do people have to go fucking like why are these people like just turning into drugs anyways like why is everything all going to shit anyways right so i mean it all comes down to like this their their entire fucking thing is the, the entire thing is a house of cards and it's it's back then you could probably say you know, like the cards were built thicker, you know, like for a temporary amount of time for maybe a generation, two generations, three generations, you can, you can live with this kind of, um, you can live with this kind of society just because they're offloading all the contradictions. You know, first it was inside the country in the most poor and more poor areas. Then it was offloading this, the contradictions overseas or whatever. Right now they have nowhere to offload it. It's, it's catching up to them. The cards are getting more fragile. The house that they built built it out of, you know, like the, of course you're gonna see all this shit. Of course you're gonna see during a pandemic they don't know what the fuck to do. There's a home and even before a pandemic, a homeless problem, right? But you have excess housing. Like how many houses were fucking like the aggregate amount of like a construction and and homes that are built and the vacancies that there there were and then the record amount of homeless people. Like they they can't reconcile, you know. And it's not America's problem. Only it's a lot of the pretty much every country on, on in the world, almost every country in the world that is developed or on the higher end of development, they get to this contradiction where it's like, you know, your your valuation of land and all these places where people where you can build residential uh, housing, it's gotten to a point where fucking you could may have ex you will have excess capacity, and you have over oversupply crisis. Meanwhile, you have a homeless crisis, but you know, you, you're if, talking if about you're, like foreign buyers, right? If you're foreign a buyers, five, own no, not even foreign buyers. It's just the valuation of property, like just mm-hmm. the way it, it, it is. Like you have to evaluate land the way you have to keep it going up, right? People don't want if how if the housing market crashed, if house prices went down, that's like a fucking siren to all these people, a whole swath of people in society, right? The government, businesses included, like they don't want that. You know, like it, it's a it's a catastrophe for them, right? Oh but, yeah, that's true. But like you look at these two problems, even if a six year old without any kind of like, without being like too fucking soaked in the world and about how normal it is, you can look at it and be like, hey, if you have all this homeless people, you have all this excess housing. Like what 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 is the problem here, right? <laughs> you got the fucking buns, you got the hot dog, you put it together. What's the problem, right? But this the way that we've the way that it's set up. 
the way that this society is set up and how 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 production is distributed and the way that the exchanges are made you can't do that you can't put the hot dog into the bun the most obvious fucking solution right you can't you you know why you can't right and there's tons of reasons too is it the is that the bun is a sandwich it's two pieces of bread and not a hot dog your house right now your house right now you can you can probably fit how many homeless people in there right but you don't want to and that's not your problem it's just the way that fucking distribution works right you you have to take a lot of money from the bank to buy the house you you have to work to get that money for it, and then you have to borrow money from the bank pay interest or whatever just to afford the valuation, all the labor, work, time that you had to put in just to buy this fucking house. That's how you're, that's how they try to, that's how the, the exchange, no, that's how hmm. the, ex, the the societal exchange has done, has it functions, right? Mm-hmm. There's a whole bunch of fucking housing that, you know, it's either above your price point, below your price point, but it doesn't matter. Like there, there has to be, it has to be exchanged with, with this value of exchange or whatever, right? Yeah, homeless people, they can't, there's no way they can even get to that level. So there's, you know, access housing and there's homeless people. And homeless people, by all, you know, for whatever problems they, in society that fucking makes up this, we're basically saying like, yeah, you can't, you can't fucking live anywhere this, unless, the, unless you have this, the money. <coughs> Sorry, this homeless issue, it's now become the government issue, right? Because by having homeless people, you can't, you can't just... Uh, get rid of them in a sense right so like they have to take care of them and it costs them money so that money would be better spent providing them a home versus providing them like constant shelter and ex- expending our emergencies some places to, to take and care rem- of them, right? remember some places they do provide them a home like it's provided by the state and i'm not talking about a fucking socialist state that's doing this like singapore does this right singapore is not I don't think it's by anyone's imagination. They're socialist. Well, Singapore... It's a very socialist pro- policy. Singapore is very organized. They distribute their houses very well. Yes, but... Can you imagine if that was the case? If if you were going to... If they are going to bring it up as one of the major election points here, how many votes do you think that guy would get? What do you think would be the articles that come out the next day? Like, if Trump says, guy? if Trump says, if I'm elected, I will get rid of all homeless people. No, if someone, if anybody, if if anybody was saying, hey, you know what, we're just going to provide housing for everyone, you know the articles that are coming out. It's like, what does this fucking guy think? How are you going to pay for all this? It's your taxpayer like, money. It's your like taxpayer Trump, money that's going to fucking go into this. Do you want that? And then Trump you know, could whole do because he has a whole hotel that he could house all the homeless people. You can house Trump can house how many people in it? It's almost like fifty million homeless in America now. He doesn't yeah. have. There's no way that he, you know, like Trump can house fifty million homeless people. <laughs> how many hotels does he have? <laughs> Not fifty million worth of homeless people. <laughs> well, you know, like the average crazy. hotel, you you can hold house like thousands of people. You mm-hmm. know, multiple hotels. You're never gonna reach even like t- hundreds, of thousands of people. Like. But just just think about this for a minute, right? You have all those homeless people, all those access housing, excess housing. You can't get them. You can't. You can't fucking get them together, right? Some places you can. What do they do that's differently? It's it's it's. At some point, one of the, the, the way Singapore looked at it was just because it was a it was a do or die moment. Where like if we don't give these people housing, we're dead as a country, right? So that was the incentive for them to be not be fucking idiots and actually adopt this very social policy of giving everybody a house. And it worked for them because it turns out if you have house ownership, if you have a home, you know you get rid of a lot of problems, just like you said and probably the study said. But the study doesn't get into like the whole fucking deeper fucking rot of the whole thing, right? Like, think about it this way. Like, what? Well, like, there's a problem already. You have excess excess housing, no one living in it, staying empty, and then you have people, you know, like, that are homeless. But, you know, the thing is, because if you're the owner of these houses or if you're the owner of royal property or real estate, this is why I wouldn't, it wouldn't even be fair to blame uh, I guess Donald Trump's class of people, not entirely their fault because this is the way this set up. Like, you know, it, it's it's like, oh, I invest all this money. You know, I need to keep on getting value for it. Homeless people come in, I don't get any value for it. Yeah, that's fair in this society. That is, it is the exact way it's set up like that. 
but you know, like you can look at it from the higher level. If you're not just a private citizen or a fucking investor or whatever, and you look at this and you're like the big leader, the people in charge, and you look at this, you'd be like, yeah, this is, well, this is a fucking problem. And then if you were the leader, if you were the ruling class and you can recognize that this is a problem and you're going to do something about it, you, it would be in your ability to actually fucking do it. But they're not going to do it, right? They're not going to do it because they're power-based. They would rather them not do it. They're kind of beholden to this kind of deal. So this is a thing that it will never... It will just keep on being a problem. It'll just keep on getting worse until it just implodes. And I think it's after it completely implodes and shit hits the fan, then people will be more amenable to be like, yeah, you know what? <laughs> Maybe housing the homeless isn't such a drastic idea. But it will t- probably take... All these things, it always takes to the point where it just fucking collapses and implodes for them to realize all this shit. But you know what? I it would I would like to see next election it, just for the fucking just for the just for the, the the entertainment value or just like the for the amusement of it. If someone proposed this, I want to see what the people. Uh, all the arguments against it for, you know, like, and I'm pretty sure I know, I, I can guess what the arguments would be. It would be the same fucking recycled shit. But <laughs> I want to see, like, what, what kind of creative arguments people will have that will, you know, like, be opposed to something like this. Opposed to housing the homeless? Yeah. Well, housing everybody in general. Mm. I think a People who feel jealous because people who pay for the homes, they'll be like, what? Now, after this point, it's a free home. Kind of yeah. Thing. Yeah. They've kind of, it's, it's, it's the most, it's one of the most successful schemes because if you recall, if you think about it, some of the most successful schemes is like, you got to get people to have a stake in the scheme, in the scam and shit like that. Right. Mm-hmm. And people do have a stake in it now. Right. If you bought a house, Anybody buying a house in this kind of in this societal economic setup right now, you want your house valuation to go up. No one ever wants their house valuation. Like the whole thing is valued, anyways, right? The ex- mm-hmm. They're all they all have a stake in in these places becoming more expensive. Maybe you know, the idea is that we need to treat life as like we don't own something; we just rent it. Like <laughs> you know, like what if homes weren't owned by anyone? That you. You apply for a home, and then if you want to move, you might have to apply for another home, and then you get like, and then there's like this network of bureaucracy that just kind of moves you around, kind of thing. <laughs> you don't want a network of bureaucracy to do that shit, anyways. That would be socialism, wasn't? Wouldn't it? That well, you could be socialism with everybody owning the land, like the one, of, all the socialist redistribution policies in the current era was basically just you give, you give everybody their share. To this day in China, like. To this day in China, if you're a peasant, no one can ever, like, no, like, real estate developer or whatever has, like, that power, you know, officially in the laws to take the land out of your ownership. Everything is, the way they do is everything is leased. Everything is leased by the state for, like, 100 years, right? So then for peasants, for people that work in, live in rural uh, areas, it's always, like, it's either you rent, you, they have the power to rent out the, their land right now, or they have the power to kind of <clears throat> only the government or whatever has the power to kind of exchange land for an actual value. They, like, they have to compensate them with something. So it's either like an ownership stake in whatever uh, apartment or whatever the fuck they build I don't know, for yeah. them, right? And there's a lot of abuses in that system too, because you can get loyal, you can get local people that want to, the local official that wants to develop a, a piece of land. They might, they might do the exchange at a little bit on uh, something under value, right? Yeah, but, but but that's not something that would fly in like Trump's America right now. No, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. I, the whole the whole thing is different, and then the whole like th- this 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 actually affected the outcome of. Uh, the 2008 financial crisis that's that's kind of like where the um the differences between how the two countries handled uh the the recovery because they both the america and china both had to do a stimulus package but 
you know what? I'll just I'll get into this in a whole another day. <laughs> but it's basically like that small that's kind of small detail kind of makes up a very significant change in how like people in society kind of deal with this. Like Singapore, everybody is afforded an HDB housing, right? You gotta they have the the different mechanisms of how you kind of pay for it. Like a portion of your paycheck goes towards it, right? But the house is fucking, it's kind of yours to kind of pay off, right? Like, they can't necessarily take the house away from you. But at the same time, it's very hard for you to actually sell your HDB or whatever, right? They have to go through a completely different kind of process. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's a completely different mindset. And it gives you, usually, it gives, it gives you way better, like, it gives you a much better stability in society. And one of these days, maybe I'll... Maybe one of these days I'll explain it, but basically the, 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 the end result is you get a lot of more societal stability if everybody owns something, either a piece of land or even, like own as in like this is theirs, this is their as their backup, their, you know, their, their fucking cushion for hard times, either like an HDB housing, your plot of rural land or anything. Like if you think about the homeless in America, they literally have, they have nothing to their name, Right. This is this is this is a time bomb. This is, like there's nothing stable about this. You know, like if, if you were going to do a, the research the research study when they made their like conclusions, it should have been in big fucking 42 font bold letters saying like this is fucked. <laughs> That's that should have been like the headline of their final their 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 final conclusion and summary of their, you know, like fucking research. Yep. I'm here. <laughs> Everybody cut out for a sec. <laughs> you made a very important point, so we all had to ponder it. Yeah, yeah, we are pondering the decisions of what kind of city do we want to live in. So, yeah, I mean, this kind of ties into my next. I, I guess we can finish it off with this final segment, and we're gonna we're gonna take bets on um, on who do you on the odds. We're gonna take some Vegas odds on. Uh, Trump versus Biden. Who's gonna win? Who's gonna win by how much? And then we'll see who comes close to uh, closest on election day. But to kind of segue into that, you're gonna get during their election, and then when they talk about these things, and then when Canada also gets our election and stuff, you're gonna hear a lot of talk about, and a lot of focus is gonna be on middle class. All of it. It's all. It's always about the middle class. It. Yes, they will always say middle class. <laughs> and what this pertains to is that's what they want you to focus. And to the out to, to, to the to the general observer, hey, I says, I, <laughs> Hassan just went on video for a second. <laughs> what? Did you see that? <laughs> no. Anyways, I'm sorry to cut you off. I would just go ahead. <laughs> what, a what a what a treat for our audio listeners <laughs> <laughs> um where was i oh yes the middle class <clears throat> everybody's gonna talk about that you're gonna hear it all the time so therefore you know you're gonna eventually process this as oh this is fucking important this is gonna be really this is the only thing to be important about and on the surface when you look at it you'll be like oh yeah it makes sense that they're pandering to the middle class that's the biggest whatever tax base or that's the biggest electoral base right majority of it will be middle class but here's the thing <laughs> remember what i said about the homeless and the time bomb and all that shit right There's, like if you if you're not middle class you, and you have nothing. You, you have nothing to lay back on. You don't have HDB housing. If you, you don't have rural land that's to your family name or whatever, right? You, you just, you're just homeless. You have nothing. And this is why I also think that fucking research is dumb in a lot of ways. Because, oh, what happens when their period of homelessness is done, right? Usually a lot of them is they just fucking die or they just fucking like just disappear off the face of the earth or whatever. Well, if they die, it's not a homeless problem anymore. Exactly. Or, or they, they go, they just live in transiently through shelters and throughout their lives. But as long, as long as they can find shelter, you know, occasionally they're not counted as homeless or something. It's, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a dumb fucking research thing. But this is the way you're going to hear a lot about the middle class and yeah, they they only want to focus on the middle class and it makes sense electorally. The big problem in society is if you have nothing as a base, no, no 
security net for anything at this base, what you get is sort of like if you if you visualize what a mega society is going to be a rhombus between all your your classes or even a diamond, right? You get the at the very tip at the top, the very richest people, right? And they kind of expand towards the middle class. You get a whole bunch of people that kind of uh, you know the broad a broad section of society will be that can count as middle class. That's you know like your your target, but then it narrows. It narrows all the way down to basically a down point where everything above that below that is just nothing. If you have a society where you do have like some sort of cushion or like a security for like the very bottom, like the the people scraping the barrel, if they have some kind of something, like I guarantee them not necessarily welfare because welfare is kind of set up in a really shitty scammy way, but like. Like I said, housing is one of the most sturdiest things it, historically, right? If you have something like that, it's not a rhombus shape anymore. It's a, it's a pyramidal shape. So what that kind of pertains to is at the very base, it is a lot more stable. Visually, you can see this, and then societally, if you think about it, it is much more stable. You can go through a lot of, lot of political crisis and still have a functioning society. The reason being is at the most basic creation of of a surplus or if you're going to just say capital the most basic creation of capital is guaranteed right if you guarantee that stuff where it's like food production and you know fucking places for people to live and stuff like that if that's guaranteed everything else kind of lies on a really sturdy foundation but what happens if you get a whole underclass of people that have nothing is at the sign of a crisis the whole thing fucking tumbles down like a, like a house of cards there's a reason why you know, this entire pandemic, you all you really need is this f- is at the maximum four to six weeks of a lockdown. Like, not no economic activity, everything, just lockdown. That'll defeat the virus. You know, like, it's the same way where the, the virus doesn't see political lines. It doesn't care about your political affiliation, what your views on abortion are. It just kills you if you're old or if you're susceptible to it, right? Nonetheless. Well, the same thing is how to defeat it. It, it. If it takes, it needs to it needs to fucking spread among people to um to to stay alive and and mutate, right? You get everybody to quarantine and fucking it dies out. You see these countries where they did it successfully, they got it under control, basically, right? Only cases they're getting are coming from out of the country. Well, the countries you can tell the countries that need to open up are the countries that. At the base of it, they can't afford or they're unable to or the societal makeup is in a way where they cannot stop this this economic activity from from they cannot stop the flow they can't stop this cycle they need to keep on turning over and over turning over again and again right if it stops it all comes down crashing like a fucking house of cards and it's because at the very base of it you know like there, the underclass literally has nothing, so it will it will just come crumble and brittle. Um, during, if you think about it, um, what kind of unemployment rate do you think the America and Canada or whatever can handle before just this, you don't have a country anymore? Like society is fucking done. They gave out a number, didn't they? I wouldn't know. <laughs> they say pretty much. Well, the, the the depression was like what twenty, approaching thirty percent, and that was the red line, right? Like, and that that was a time when people, uh, a substantial portion of America, especially, still lived on the farm. There was a big, large, substantial amount that, if push came to shove, they can still grow crops no matter how poor they were, right? Like that's that counts as a, a, a actual sturdy base. Nowadays, if they ever get to that number, if they ever get 20-25% unemployment, they're looking at fucking the collapse of a country, right? The longer it goes on at that, those levels of unemployment, the longer you can... You can it, they're, they're looking at that shit. What's the rate right now in U.S. with COVID and everything? They won't follow those numbers, but it's, it's, it's like double digits. It's in the teens yeah. if, you're, if you're really pessimistic. You know, <laughs> at least 10 percent, right? Ten ish, right? But remember, yeah. this is also when they're still, they still they can mitigate it with government assist. It's 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 cash assistance, right? Yeah. So it's not thing permanent. It's not like you give everybody something permanent. Yes. Yeah. Transient. It's cash. So 
you can mitigate it for now. But there's only so long you can do that. So there's long. only so long. Exactly. When okay, so some of these countries, the one one of the most stable ones. Uh, if you think about Singapore during its during its uh, crisis years, China during this crisis year, China during its crisis years, upwards of uh, pretty much half during the crisis years of Great Leap Forward, almost half of the entire country in some way experienced unemployment, right? The country didn't collapse. If you had the same thing in America, like Roosevelt even said, like you you get anything upwards of that, we're done. Like you're done. China had that historically. And what it did was, all it did was it moved labor down from cities down to the countryside. And they could survive that because because the countryside was guaranteed, everybody had guaranteed some plot of land or whatever, right? And then whatever collectivized policies, you can actually absorb that excess labor. And Singapore too, like during the whatever riots or whatever, it was the highest point of unemployment, whatever they had. Well, you know what? Like fucking it's mitigated because every you, 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 you can give everybody a home basically, right? If you have that base, like that, that's the whole point. Like, like you, you need to give the, you need to make sure that your society has some sort of like an actual net, like a real safety net, not like some scammy welfare, um, food stamp for whatever black communities sort of, uh, thing going along, you know, for the votes and whatnot, but like an actual fucking secure, stable sort of deal, you're gonna, you know, you're, you actually build up something that's quite sturdy. So, and this is one of the things where it's like, I always see this problem. And then you bring up this study where like there's whole, there's excess amount of homelessness, but there's excess fucking, you know, like housing capacity and even production itself. Like there's ex- there's excess a lot of everything, right? And yet you have, <laughs> and yet you have these problems. Like the, like you're you're just watching the clock go down on a bomb. That's what it feels like to me. Sorry, was this a tangent to the wager? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> it does actually connect. I totally forgot about. It. Okay, so they're gonna talk to you about the middle class all the time in these elections, and this is when you kind of know, like, yeah, you know what? This is this is all fucking empty talk. Who gives a shit? If um they all and you can see it in America right now, all Biden and Trump wanted target is kind of the middle class and but trump during his time uh battling hillary he did something where it it gave him a substantial boost in his win where he didn't just target the middle class in 2016 they targeted working class and everybody that was kind of he tried to reach out to those places where it was like underclass people right like people you wouldn't go to you wouldn't fly over states right and he kind of won that in this kind of election they're not really they will pay lip service to those people, but their their campaigns are all focusing on middle class people, right? This is all just a fucking. It's it's basically just, it's it's all band aid shit. Like you will see it in our elections too, where Trudeau and whoever you know Aaron O'Toole or whoever the fuck the next uh, the, you know the conservative liberals and and the NDP. They're all going to argue. They're all at least going to argue about, you know, like we need to give more or whatever assistance to the middle class. Sometimes you're conservatives, you'll be like, yeah, give more to the rich class. If you keep on doing it this way, it's going to look bad. And every time they kind of middle, they mention like all these things, policies for the middle class, no one mentions like, if, if no one mentions, what are they going to do to this brittle underclass that will make up the ba- the societal base? You know, it's eventually it's going to atrophy. It's going to be bad. It's going to it's going to decay. It's going to bite you in the ass really hard. And you can tell politicians are always full of shit. They're always going after the votes and everything, because they will always talk middle class, middle class, middle class, middle class, middle class. That's all I want to say. Anybody that you know, like fucking people that want to like decipher election talk and shit. This is this is the bullshit everybody's going to say. Middle class this, middle class that, middle class everything. And 
it's kind of a feedback loop because the more they talk about it, the more you think it's important. The more you think that's the only thing that you should think about. And it's going to keep on going that way. Until one day, you know, shit hits the fan and you're like, what the fuck's happening? I thought the middle class was taken care of. <laughs> that's the end of what I wanted to say. And just to finish off, I guess, with our little wager, what do you guys, who do you guys think will win and by how much in the American election? I am the least educated, so I am not going first. <laughs> uh, Trump with the electoral win again. By how much? Like a landslide or is it just barely scraped by? Uh, he will probably lose the popular vote, but win by the electoral <laughs> college, how he did it last time. No, but like how much? Like just, oh, scrape by, you said, right? Yeah, he'll just win by technicality, like the electoral college. What about you, Hazan? Trump will still win. It might be close, but I think it'll still be him. But I just want to say what I would like to see is Biden win by just a bit and then watch the tra- tantrum that Trump will. It's apparently going to be a train wreck because you know what they're saying about the whole fucking thing and what CNN is trying to say about like uh, election election day versus you know the mail-in ballots and shit, right? They're all worried yeah. that he's going to pull a fast. <laughs> he's not going to accept the results. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, that's nothing special. He even said that in 2016. He said, if Hillary wins, then it's rigged. And if I win, then it, it's... Oh, yeah, it's the it, best it, option it, select. It's Whatever rigged. results, it's always in his favor. Yeah. yeah, but this time he's actually the president, right? So, <laughs> Right. right. <laughs> yeah, that does change things. Are you guys familiar with the whole fucking thing that they, everybody's making a big deal about right now? The mail-in ballots? The mail-in they, ballots versus... They the, might not come in time soon and yeah. people have to stand in line and the line gets longer because they would have to cancel their mail-in ballots. No, 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 no. That's your thing that you're fucking worried about. <laughs> that's your <laughs> shit. No, no. The thing where, like, like, they'll call it illegitimate or some shit. Have you heard about this? I don't know. If, I don't know. If they're worried because it's legitimate. So no, it no, matter, no, right? no. Yeah, okay. I... Okay, make it... To make it brief... Um. Because of the way the 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 context between these votes, Biden's likely gonna they they're saying Biden's likely gonna get a lot more mail in ballots. Trump's gonna get a lot more, you know, show up at the polling station on the day ballots. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's gonna happen is gonna there's gonna be a lag and to, uh, because of the coronavirus, specifically because of coronavirus, there's gonna be this special, I guess, election um, possibility. Uh, before in all the other presidential elections, you usually get your results, election day or whatnot. And, you know, Gore or Bush, that was a special case that it was really fucked up to. And it was laughably fucking, you know, fucked up or slash rigged, however you want to look at it, just because they had to count the ballots and all that. But usually they kind of call, they have enough to call the winner on election day, election night. Because of COVID and the mail-in ballots, it, you know, like you, they're still... you. It, they may not get the full count enough on election day. It might be like election week or election weeks, right? What they're all worried about is that Trump's face, because in on election night, if it goes towards their projections, Trump will get look like he won on election night, right? And traditionally, you know, fucking they'd like to call on election night. But... What they're, you know, what CNN and all those guys are saying, and a lot of, the, to be fair, a lot of the polls are kind of pointing to a, a a Biden victory as well, right? If Biden wins, it's gonna the majority, a lot of it is gonna be by the mail-in ballots that won't be counted on election night, and it'll be later. What they're worried about is you're gonna have a situation where Trump and Trump's base will say, "What the fuck? I won on election night. What the fuck is this shit? This is rigged. This is illegitimate." I what oh you, you know, it's like I you know demand recount or you know so just straight up say it's rigged. You may get a thing where it's like Trump will lose weeks later after the the mail in ballots are counted and Biden is the winner, but there might be some kind of crisis because you know it's not just him saying it. There might be a substantial amount of Americans that supported him saying yeah this is rigged. You know like to them it'll look like it was rigged, right? And they'll say, you know, this is fucking, they stole, they're stealing an election from us. This is like a third world dictatorial country or whatever. They're worried that 
some sort of conflict, whether it's like just, you know, like just fucking like people getting angry at each other or if people actually fucking live start firing bullets at each other. They're afraid of that happening because of this discrepancy. Okay. Anyways, we should wrap it up. Jason. What is your well, idea? since everyone said Trump, I'll go Biden. <laughs> Just because you can't really make it an interesting bet if everyone's on the same side. Uh, speaking of which, though, hey, if any of our audience would like to weigh in, you could feel free to tell us what who you think will win the election by how much on our Twitter at Verbal Laxative or YouTube, whatever the hell you could type in. And then if whoever wins, which one, ever one of us, uh, will let whoever decide what the reward will be. And uh, if there has been no suggestions from the audience of what the reward shall be, we will just come up with one ourselves. I will come up with this. If I'm wrong, my prediction is wrong. That would be fine. (laughs) (laughs) It's a win-win. I think the reward will just have to... so (laughs) scammy. The reward will just be having to do something with Jason's body, I think. That's why I don't want that. And the punishment as well. (laughs) <laughs> There's never any winning. All right. With that note, close this off. <laughs> you know what? If I if I if I could, I would I would love to bet on the possibility of just them fucking fracturing <laughs> over this stupid mail in ballot contention. I would love to mm-hmm. see. I would love. Oh fuck, that'd be great. I would have. Nope. I would have a fucking ball of no time. president. No president has called. No, I would love it. Sorry. I would love it. Whereas Trump's like, yeah, I'm not leaving. <laughs> and then, then I just, everything goes on. I love that. It's, it's 20, 20, 2021. We have two presidents. Oh, my God. Yes, two Americas. Oh, God, that'd be so great. That'd be interesting at the very least. Back to <laughs> Civil War scenarios. We're in brand yes. new territory, so this, any of this is possible. <laughs> I yeah. Mean, we even didn't we have one podcast where we talked about hypothetically yeah. hypothetical one of our first podcast yeah. Yeah. yeah that was kind of split between um um just like area though this one would be by it would be a much more cleaner one i guess just trump versus biden this is this would be the two parties versus each other elephant versus donkey well it's thanks for real. listening tune in next time and we will discuss Something. This is the weakest ending. (laughs) (laughs) I thought someone else was going to say something. (laughs) The usual. um, Thanks for listening. Uh, (laughs) The audio is falling apart. The audio is falling apart. (laughs) I don't remember what we usually say. All right. Let's wrap it up. Usually I just do dishes. Let's end it on a real awkward note. (laughs) Already done. Yep. <laughs> Good night. You want to do the Craig Ferguson and just have an awkward silence? That was painful. <laughs> this is painful. All right. So it's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, he hasn't shut off Craig yet. <sighs> anyway, all right. I need to go. I'm totally leaving all of that in. All right. See, <laughs> bye, everybody. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs>